All right, so my talk this evening, um, I'm calling it Productful Conversations, which is a, a fun little play on words that hopefully it uh, come, becomes kind of apparent why, why I chose this. Um, and actually, because, because I'm a procrastinator and, uh, and these sorts of things are never, are never done for me, I could, I could claim that it's just about being agile and always trying to make something better, but I'm actually just really lazy and I was watching YouTube videos too late today and realized I had to make a couple of changes. Um, and, and actually, and this is, a, I promise, a true story. Um, yesterday, I was out walking, I'm um, dog sitting, and I was out walking my friend's dog, and we found a, uh, a kitten out while we were walking. And I say that mostly because I just wanted to tell you because I'm so excited about this little kitten that's now living in the bathroom of my friend's apartment that I'm staying in. But I have figured out a way to wedge it into my conversation, into this conversation, and we will see the kitten later. So that's something to get excited about. So this is, if you're wondering what changes I was making like five minutes before I hopped in the car to head over here, I was inserting a picture of the kitten somewhere in the slideshow. And so we'll see if we can find it. It's gonna be pretty, pretty subtle. So um, I wanna start with now a different story, one that's a little bit more product centric. Um, one, of my favorite, one of my favorite product stories is about Airbnb. So uh, if you don't know the full story of kind of how Brian Chesky and the rest of his team started Airbnb, it's a really, really cool story. I won't get into all of the details, but it involves going to the Democratic National Convention and selling cereal in order to finance the sort of first iteration of the product. And there's a lot of really cool kind of bits and pieces to it. But one of my favorites is that uh, after they joined Y Combinator, uh, Brian Chesky and his team were talking to Paul Grands, one of the founders, and they were talking about, you know, they were having trouble growing their platform, having trouble figuring out what, what it is that, that they needed to do next. And Paul Graham asked them, well, where are your users? And they said, well, we've gotten some traction, some small amount of traction in New York City. And Paul Graham just said, you need to go there. You need to go to New York City and be where your, your users are. And so uh, over the course of their Y Combinator stint, Brian Chesky and his team actually commuted from the Bay Area to New York on a weekly basis to go and interact with their users. And the way that they did it, because they didn't want to just knock on random people's doors and say like, hey, we looked at your data and we realized that you're using our platform. Can we just talk to you about why you let random people sleep on your couch? They, uh, they posed as, as uh, photographers offering to take professional photos of their apartments to like enhance their profile mm -hmm. on, on Airbnb. And they used it as a way to get in and talk to their users. Uh, to have kind of those real conversations with their users about what value they were getting from Airbnb and why was it that they were okay and their neighbors weren't with this whole idea of changing the game by letting people just crash on your couch. Um, so I, I say that because one of the one of the important themes that I see across uh, across product management, like great product managers, uh, care really really deeply about people. It's it's really easy to get really into uh, processes, tools, technology, all these things to the point where the actual people behind the products that we're building get somewhat phased out and ignored. So what we're gonna talk about today is the difference between shared knowledge and shared understanding and what that has to do with delivering great product. We're gonna talk about then how discussions with our users, how we gather shared understanding from our users and how we translate that shared understanding to engineering teams in a way that helps us build great products. So, um, a little bit about my background. I won't talk about myself too much, but I graduated Notre Dame uh, with a degree in electrical engineering. Uh, it's a small school in the middle of nowhere in Indiana. I started as an electrical engineer at Pacific Gas and Electric. Did that just long enough to realize that I did not like electrical engineering and found my way onto a, onto a group there that was doing uh, internal software, like data analytics tools for internal users. And after a while, I was talking to a friend and they said, you know, what you're doing sounds like product management. Have you ever like look, looked that up? So I went home and I Googled it and I like essentially looked at the checkboxes of what does a product manager do and realized, oh yeah, those are all the things that I did. So I went in the office the next day and told my boss like, hey, can you change my title to product manager? Um, and so that's my story of how I kind of like fell into product management. One of the cool things about PM is that everyone kind of has their own story about how they kind of found it. 
Um, I went from there to, I jumped into data science product management. I got a little bit of exposure to data science, uh, fell in love with it, went to a real estate, a small real estate company in Emeryville, where I kind of got my hands uh, dirty, helped them build up a data science team, uh, did a lot of really cool stuff around like home price evaluation, prediction, uh, search engine ranking, kind of we got to span the breadth of kind of B2B and B2C sort of data science applications. And that was really cool. We were running around like chickens with our head cut, heads cut off and not always making the impacts that we wanted to. But we got to, we got to like try a bunch of stuff even though we kept changing direction. And then, yeah. Hey, um, would you say your, how would you say your transition was from being a product manager at PG&E to Zap Labs? Was it was it something you found and stumbled upon and how? Yeah, so I made the transition. Uh, I made the transition because I, the more I learned about product management, I, I became like a voracious uh, reader of everything I could find around, around product management. I read, you know, Peter Thiel's Zero One and uh, Chris Sims, uh, The Essentials of Scrum and a bunch of other really, really great books. Um, and the more I learned about product management, the more I realized that a large corporate utility wasn't the best place to build innovative software, go figure, uh, which was too bad because there were actually a lot of really, really compelling problems to solve in, in that utility space. Uh, but PG wasn't exactly built to do it in a way that I felt was going to engage me. And so I went out really looking for an environment that would let me do that. And so it was a very, it was a very deliberate decision to kind of put myself out there. I started blogging about product management to kind of try and create a little bit of a brand for myself. And that's been something I've carried through and uh, really recommend writing is a really great way to kind of express your, your viewpoint as a product manager and put together a kind of a portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and then, and then eventually a recruiter from Zap Labs reached out to me and uh, came in connected with their team, connected with the data scientists there and, and kind of went from there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, awesome. And then uh, from there, yeah, and then from there, I, I decided to move down here to South Bay, uh, started with Juventus, I've been there for about a year, um, where I'm now a, I'm a senior product manager at Juventus, uh, where I do, where the Juventus is a company that uh, builds hospital operation software with AI at its core. Um, we, we do a lot of stuff around helping teams prioritize patient care and, and uh, things like that, guiding, guiding operations around the hospital. And, uh, and my role there involves a really wide breadth of things. I own pretty much all of our user-facing product at this point because we had a PM who left and so now I'm two PMs. And, uh, and I also work with our data science team to develop a lot of our, uh, a lot of our data science algorithms. And then uh, also over the course of, of my not too long career, I've gotten into a few side projects. Most of them kind of, most of them disappointingly not as cool as they sound, like the Nightlife mobile app, not as much fun as it, as it might sound. But, uh, but you know, lots of lessons learned. Um, I was a co-founder of a startup accelerator for a time that was even more ill-fated. Uh, and I've kind of dipped my hand into product consulting. It turns out that people who need product consulting don't typically know they need product consulting, which is an issue that I'll solve at some point. Maybe not. And uh, as I said, I write a lot. Uh, my blog is Medium, uh, Medium at Jack Not John. And, uh, and I love to play Ultimate Frisbee. If you look at my backpack, I've got a Frisbee clipped to my backpack at all times, just in case. <laughs> all right, jumping in. Uh, if you haven't read Jeff Patton and his book on user story mapping, I really highly recommend it. Jeff Patton is one of my favorite product management authors. Uh, shared understanding is when we both understand what the other person is imagining and why. This is kind of a universal concept that we're gonna keep coming back to um, around uh, the difference between shared knowledge and shared understanding. So shared knowledge, <laughs> shared knowledge, I think it's just kind of illustrated here. It's, it's, uh, it's what happens, shared knowledge is what happens when you read, uh, when you just like read an acceptance criteria about all the things that, are, that a product needs to do without understanding the context around why it needs to do those things. Uh, it's the reason why, like this is a really good illustration I think of, of kind of prototyping and, and uh, the sorts of discussions, how discussions lead to shared understanding and bridge that gap from shared knowledge to shared understanding. It's also why, uh, it's also why I really don't, I really shy away from documentation as a primary means of communicating uh, product requirements and I really love having really heavy conversations and we'll, and we'll talk about that. And so talking about shared understanding, it's the job of a product manager to 
take an understanding of a problem that a user is having and translate that into understanding of uh, into engineers understanding of how to solve that problem. So product manager at the very core, if I were to describe product management in a nutshell, it's understanding someone's problem and translating it to someone who can actually solve it. Um, so it's a we're, we're a fun like go between where we have to know what everyone is talking about and be able to translate that concept to a bunch of to a really wide range of different people. So there are two sides to that coin. The first is we have to understand our users' problems. So what are the ways that we can do that? A lot of times, customers' problems are really complex. Uh, if you haven't heard this sort of apocryphal tale of the elephant. Uh, imagine a bunch of blind people are examining this elephant. You have someone who's touching the trunk and says, oh, I'm looking at a spear. Person on the tail is, says it's a rope. Um, really, you only get a full understanding of what's going on until you back up, you get the full picture. What this ends up looking like in product is, uh, this is, this is the, like a very basic layout of what ends up happening when we're interacting with users. A user over on the left, a user has a problem. They don't tell you about their problem. They tell you what they want, right? Uh, it's, that, it's that classic Henry Ford quote, if I had built what people asked me, I would have made a faster horse. Yep. Uh, users don't ask for what is going to optimally solve their problem, typically. They, they ask for what they, what they think might solve it. And uh, the, fun, the fun thing is that the things that users really want, innovative products, are by definition things that most people cannot ask for because an innovative product at its core is something that kind of reframes a problem in a way that someone hadn't been thinking about it before. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go. This is kind of the ideal, right? This is where we're trying to get. The user has a problem, they tell us what they want, and we intuitively say, oh, well, I know what you're asking for, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually go in and solve your problem. The issue, what ends up clouding this issue is that uh, a lot of times we don't have we don't, we don't have all that direct access to our customer because interacting with directly with customers is really hard. Uh, sometimes sometimes uh, this is coming through a middleman. You have someone who is talking to users on your behalf and they're telling you what users are saying. This can be sales, can be marketing, can be customer success, could be even UX research. You can have a dedicated team to UX research and still have this, uh, this get lost in translation. My favorite, my, my, it's because I've uh, mainly done B2B software where the customer who's buying your software and the person who's using it are not the same person. This is my favorite model, where a customer is telling you what the user said they want. They're relaying that to a salesperson who's then telling you what the boss said that their user want. And typically, everybody misunderstands everybody. So what are some of the ways, uh, what are some of the ways that we can get into going beyond just giving people what they ask for and going as far as giving people what they need. So there's a spectrum of different ways that products, people can interact uh, with users. I have touched on a few different ones here. Um, there's the spectrum of discovery to validation. On the left is discovery where you don't know what a user's problem is, you don't know how to solve it, but you know that there's, there's something there. You know, someone's reaching out to you saying, I'm having some sort of problem, and you think you might be able to solve it. On the right is validation, where <clears throat> you think you understand the problem, and you think you know how to solve it, but you want to try and make sure why. And as we go through, we shift from really heavy discovery interactions to really heavy validation interactions, and uh, there's a spectrum. There's a spectrum there. Um, and, and I will mention, I'll, I'll, we'll go through and mention a few of these, I think, you know, on the, left, on the left here, you see uh, these are all different techniques for doing this user research. Uh, just as simple as observation, following people around. So at Cuventus, one of the things that, that I really, really appreciate about my job, I joined in the end of June of last year. Uh, I joined at the um, June 24th of last year, and by July 2nd, I was in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, following around a nurse doing rounds in a hospital. I had, I had no idea what Cuventus even built yet. But I was, I was going around following around a nurse and trying to understand what problems she was experiencing on a day-to-day -day, uh, and, and building up my baseline understanding of who are the people that we're serving and what are the problems that they have. 
and it's it's incredibly valuable. I think I, I probably spend, I, I encourage product managers to spend at least 20% of their time talking directly to users. So, uh, so going back, talking about discovery, how do we how do we actually break down this wall, uh, you know, uh, break down this game of telephone that's happening here? The, so, yeah, just a short question. So, where do the UX people come in here? Yeah. So, UX people, uh, the person who the, the person who taught me this, who like the, who first showed me this spectrum and first talked to me and first taught me a lot of the ins and outs of of all of the, all of these things was a UX researcher that I that I worked with when I was at. Uh, when I was at Zap Labs, we had a really incredible uh, UX research team, um, and they UX research is, is incredibly valuable. I would say it does not it does not replace a product manager's need to get in front of users. Why? Because there is always going to be something lost in translation. Regardless of how good a UX a US, a UX research team is, they're never going to be able to fully translate that shared understanding of what a user needs and like what a user's context is, uh, compared to you actually being there, getting to see some of the some of the just minutia of that human interaction. So, um, the biggest thing that we can do with regards to trying to eliminate this problem, because it's a bear, uh, is to actually get in front of your users. The kind of, like we've said, this game of the game of telephone, there is really little, there's not that much that you can do to, to fix it, to help your salesperson understand. You know, we're, we're not gonna train the salesperson to be a product manager, right? The, by virtue of us being product managers, we have the we are equipped with those tools where we can understand what the users want better than someone who comes in with a really heavy sales bias or a really heavy marketing bias or kind of frankly whatever bias. Um, and we also need to recognize that even product managers come in with their own bias. I have my favorite I have my favorite products that my like pipe dream things that I want to build, and every time I interact with a user, I have to stop myself from shoehorning whatever they're saying into a mental model in my mind of, oh cool, that this is just giving me permission to build that thing I know I want to build, right? You have to kind of check yourself against those biases. Um, one, one way, and by the way, and so uh, uh, another, another aspect that's, that's really important here to this discovery, uh, to this discovery is this, this problem of the user who asks for the triangle when their problem is the star. The one technique that I've really, really come to like uh, that users find it to be a little bit odd, but uh, it's called the five whys. It's asking someone, why do you want that? Uh, so that I can do this. Why do you want to do that? So I can see this result. Why is that result important? And it, so it's, uh, it's this technique of really getting at the root of why they're asking for something. Um, and a lot of times I'll frame that as, I'm going to do this exercise called five whys. I'm not just trying to be a petulant child. I'm not just trying to ask you, I'm not just gonna be here asking why, like a toddler, uh, because I don't know what else to say. This is actually an exercise that, that I found to be productive. It's, uh, it's, it's actually, it helps develop some really close relationships with users when they're able to kind of feel you getting at the root of the problem. Because there's, there's, really, uh, there's something really cool about a user coming to a shared understanding with you about what their problem actually is. And, uh, and so this is kind of what I'm talking about. One of the, the, the key thing that, uh, that we have to think about when we're doing this discovery work is challenging our mental models. So we go into these, all, when I talk about these preconceived notions, they often take the form of these mental models. And so, um, and so our job is to go in, figure out what problems there are, there, there are and challenge our mental models. And this is where, careful, it's, it's easy to miss it. Get and break. Okay. <laughs> so the kid. Let me tell you about this kid. Dude's adorable. He kept me up all night because he was in the bathroom like meowing like crazy. But anyway, he's still adorable. This is why I'm kind of plucky today because I did not get much sleep. But it fits here. I swear it fits. I was talking to uh, the co-founder of my company because of course the first thing that I did was post this on our company Slack channel and be like, holy crap, I found a kid. And uh, I was asking around the I was asking around the company's uh, the company's website or the company you know, Slack channel saying like hey what, where should I take this cat I want to you know I, I need to find a shelter which shelter do I take it to and I, I got online and I got online and, and 
the local area here is like a rat's nest where there's a, a there's a shelter in Milpitas that only takes animals that were found in Sunnyvale, and there's a, and that's the closest animal shelter to me. But they don't accept animals that were found in Milpitas, and so but there's another animal shelter, and so it, it was this whole really confusing environment, and I was having trouble finding. I was having trouble kind of solving this problem. So I, I came into it with this problem in my head of, I need to find the right shelter for this cat so that I can get rid of it because I, I don't have it, I'm not gonna adopt the cat. Um, and and my, my uh, founder said, well, have you just tried asking whether anyone in the company wants to adopt it? Then you don't have to worry about it. And, and when I was kind of thinking today about like, oh, what are some good examples that I can talk to people about, about what are, what are kind of examples of mental models uh, challenging, yeah, challenging mental models. I realized, like, oh, this, here's like a fun, here's like a fun example of, you know, I, I'm not looking. My problem is not that I don't know which shelter to send this cat to. It's that I don't have a place to send this cat. And so, uh, and so now I have. I just reached out to my friends. I like put it on. I put it on Facebook, and I sent it to my Ultimate Frisbee Team Slack channel because, of course, the Silicon Valley Ultimate Frisbee Team we have a Slack channel. And uh, and I found like four people who now want to adopt this cat. So like, problem solved. And that, even though I have no fucking clue, sorry, okay. Um, <laughs> even though I have no clue what animal shelter I should have taken this cat to. And, and I don't know, and no one might ever know. But I think these animal shelters are empties because no one can figure it out. Um, <laughs> <Sounds crazy>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another example that people have probably heard before, this is like a really popular example. Uh, and it might be apocryphal because I don't, I don't know where this, every time I read it, it happened in a different place, but uh, there's this problem of the elevator is too slow. Users, uh, people, people in this office building are complaining that the elevator ride takes too long. And so someone who is in this kind of solution mode, who's not challenging their mental models, is going to say, okay, well, we need to make the elevator faster. How can we do that? We, you know, we have to reinstall a new elevator. Let's make more elevators so that it doesn't have to stop in as many places. Let's soup up the elevator with... I don't know, turbochargers, or let's make a hyperloop that goes from the ground floor to the top floor, and it'll be great. It'll be really expensive, but yeah, we'll, we'll make the change. Reframing the problem, challenging our mental model, we say, like, well, maybe the problem isn't that the elevator's too slow. The building manager, the, build, the building tenants are asking us to make the, the uh, elevator faster, but the real problem is that they're bored. They feel, like they're, feel, they feel like they're waiting for a long time. And so reframing the problem, the wait is annoying. How do we solve that? And so there is this, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's real or not, but the story is they put up mirrors in the elevator lobby and by virtue of people having, being able to look at themselves because people are vain, and that of course is what fixed the problem, um, just felt that the wait was shorter and solved the problem. People stopped complaining. Uh, we had a similar problem recently um, that I just kind of realized. Um, our users were complaining they have uh, our users are in our emergency room are running around with with iPhones, um, getting notifications all day. They're getting notifications when an ambulance arrives, when medication is ready for one of their patients, when one of the patients has a stroke. You know, all of these things. They're co constantly, constantly going off. We were getting complaints from users that uh, they can't hear the Cuventus noise. They can't hear when nudges, when our when our uh, our, our uh, notifications are happening. On mobile device and they said like oh well something and we had a bunch of users including one really really vocal and adamant nurse manager say there's something wrong with your code where your beeps are not as loud as the other apps beeps and of course that's not the case because it turns out that's not how mobile apps work and we couldn't go into the code and make our beeps louder <laughs> but what we did try is finding a more distinctive noise um, so we you know kind of said, oh, well, what if we change it? What if we change it so that our, our noise just sounds unlike all the other notification sounds? And, uh, and actually, instead of asking, we just did it. And they stopped complaining. Go figure. And so, and what was fun is that uh, even when we went out and reached out to this particularly vocal nurse manager and said, like, hey, have you noticed any problems? And she said, no, you guys fixed it. You made it louder. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally made a letter. We're going to get into validation here in a second, but tra transitioning over into validation, um, once someone can see and actually interact and touch with something, that's when you really start to learn whether or not whether or not what you've built is going to help them solve a task. 
And, uh, and so there's a little bit of that kind of product intuition that, that is required to say, here's what, here's what they told us. You know, we, we did the five whys. We understand, we think we understand the problem that they're actually trying to solve. And we think that we found a solution mm -hmm. that might solve that problem. Mm -hmm. um, until then, until you can actually put it in front of a user and uh, until you can actually put it in front of a user and, and see how it affects their behavior, it's just a hypothesis. Okay. And frankly, until really, it's, it's a hypothesis until you put it out in the actual world and ask people to pay for it and it's deployed in production and all of these things. And, and really, user research and, and especially getting the validation is a process of trying to figure out uh, trying to get as much proof as you can that something is either valuable or not mm -hmm. because at the end of the day engineering resources are really precious and constrained and we cannot afford to have engineers spend time building things that are not valuable right. so it's our job to get out of this funnel with as high quality and understanding of of what is valuable or what is not valuable mm -hmm. as we can mm -hmm. and uh and it's tough because we have limited time. So you have to be really deliberate about the conversations that you're having with people in order to develop that, that understanding. Getting the validation. So we've talked to a user. We think we understand what the problem is. Um, we, you know, we meet up with, the, with, our, with our designer, with our lead engineer. We figure out how do we think we might be able to solve this problem. Um, and and we, we come up with a solution. So this is a... I'm going to misattribute this. I forget exactly which product person I saw this from first, but it's a, it's a, I want to say, I'm not sure. Um, but this is something that's fairly ubiquitous. It's the, the four, the four risks of, of product. Um, and when you get into validation, it's evaluating your product along, along these criteria, uh, value risk. Uh, if it's going to solve a problem that is important. So if this is, uh, if a user wants to, uh, a user wants to be able to, to do something, but is that actually going to deliver some real value? So you can, the, the, probably the worst thing that you can do is wait, is have a user, convince a user to invest a bunch of their time doing something that ultimately is not valuable for them. They're really gonna hate you if you do that. Usability risk. Are they going to be able to use your product to achieve that value? So you found a product that does something interesting, uh, that does something valuable, but can the user actually use it? The best way to go about doing this is with usability testing, which is building a building a product. Um, by the way, the, like when I say build a product, it does not have to be code. Um, I've I've used I've used construction paper. I've used PowerPoint slides. I've used you know there are more traditional tools like Envision and and kind of actual prototyping tools. Uh, you, it's really really valuable to find a way to have a product that someone can feel is is workable that you can ask a user to click on and perform tasks uh, and, and that it really helps to bridge that gap of what the user thinks is going to be, be valuable and what's actually valuable um, yeah so also a question to that so a lot of these things also sound like things your ex people would do and that's that's why my question is how yeah. much UX knowledge should you acquire beforehand, and how do you go about doing that? It depends on it depends on the environment. Mm -hmm. So, product management is a role that can change really, really drastically from company to company. Mm -hmm. um, at at Qventus, we don't have anything in the way of, of UX research. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, in a in a place where um, and uh, a, uh, Marty Kagan in his book Inspired has a really good chapter on kind of roles and responsibilities in agile and agile product teams that talks about this. But um, if you don't have UX research, it generally falls it traditionally traditionally falls on design to lead up UX research. And it's really important to involve design in if you have a really strong designer. Uh, it's it's always really really cool to see what a designer will come up with in terms of like here's a way that we might solve this problem. Uh, and you know, if, if you can solve the problem more interesting in a more interesting way the first time, you have to iterate less because you're taking shots that are, you're taking more shots on goal. Um, but yeah, if you do have UX research who's doing this, who's doing this prototyping and uh, I would say typically UX research, I've seen, I've seen a mix in terms of whether or not UX research does actual like prototyping. And sometimes it's, UX research is just translating user right. needs and things, and then 
the team does the prototyping, then you pass the prototyping back to UX research and they administer the testing. That's what I've seen as a more traditional model of how UX research works. Um, but uh, one of the things I love to say about, about product management is product managers fill the gaps that teams don't realize they have. So it's it's up to the product manager to be kind of that entrepreneur and say, I know what are what all the things are that need to happen, and I need to recognize when any of those jobs are not getting done. Mm -hmm. So I like to say product management is one of those mile wide, foot deep sorts of jobs mm -hmm. where you have to know a little bit about everything. And typically, product managers, really strong ones, are are really voracious learners. Mm -hmm. Where when they're challenged with with something like, oh, I just realized that there's no one doing UX research they pick up that gauntlet and they go and learn what they need to learn about doing UX research so that they can fill that gap. Um, and then a couple of tips, this is, I'm not gonna deep dive too much on validation, but have them show you, not tell you. This is what I was talking about with regards to prototype testing. Put something in front of your users and ask them, ask them accomplish this task. If you've ever, if you've ever had the chance to participate in a UX research study like this, uh, I highly recommend it. It's really interesting to watch someone who's working on a consumer product ask you questions like, how would you go about logging in from this page? And all these things, it feels weird. You feel like a test subject in the moment, but you can tell, You can being a UX or UX research person or product person in that situation, you can feel like how valuable just being able to watch like all the places my cursor goes before clicking on the thing that's obviously the right place to click, right? The person who designed it says, oh, well, there's no way they could, they could click anywhere but this really obvious login button. And there's nothing more frustrating than watching a user like scroll down and like, oh, maybe it's in the footer. Maybe it's down here in the footer. <laughs> maybe it's on this other, maybe I have to click on the about page and like look at the picture of the CEO in order to find the login page. It's amazing what you can learn. Um, never ask, do you like this? Or if you do, make sure it's, make sure it's just one of many, make sure it's one amongst all of these other types of questions. This is just like when you're getting into actual like conversations with users about something, Maybe you don't have a prototype yet. Maybe you're talking about a concept. Uh, asking, do you like this? People like a lot of stuff that they don't use, that they don't get value from. You know, I really like that kitten, but I'm allergic to cats, so I'm not going to use it. That would have sounded bad. Um, what price would you pay? What would you actually pay for this product? One of my favorites that, uh, that my boss taught me is, if you were to pitch this to someone else, how would you do it? What would you communicate as the big value add? Like if you had to go, if you, imagine you decided you really love this product, let's make that leap. How would you tell your boss to buy it, to buy this product? What would you tell them about it? Or maybe you're even earlier in the process and you're talking about problems that you might be able to solve. The user's telling you, well, here are, we've identified three or four different areas that we could potentially go into. Here's a hundred dollars. How would you divvy up that money in, in in solving each of these four potential problems? Um, or just some actually, actually ask someone to buy it. If you have a prototype, there's there's all sorts of fun stuff you can do around saying like, oh, well, it'll be available in a month. Go ahead and buy it now. Here's what you see a lot. Right, going back to our little colorful people, our little colorful colorful avatars. I see a problem. I write a JIRA ticket. Here's the thing, it's, got, it's yellow, it's gotta be pointy. And the engineering team says like, oh, of course, it's a triangle. It's a problem, it's a problem. Uh, uh, as we kind of said, all these resources time is incredibly valuable. And if we are doing that poor job of translating value, then something is wrong. Obviously, this is a really simplistic example, but it highlights the principle of kind of one of the things I touched on earlier of some of the imperfection of documentation. This is translation of shared knowledge, not shared understanding. So uh, so we're going to talk about some techniques that we can use that we can use to uh, bridge that gap and develop shared understanding. Uh, both with users, how we can engineer, how we can engage our team to help uh, understand users better. And then once we under once we think we understand how we're going to solve the user's problem, how we then translate that concept accurately back to our team. So before I jump into the, those actual techniques, if you haven't seen the product manager's motto, with great responsibility comes no power. Yep. Uh, product managers don't actually manage all that many people usually, which is you know, really weird trying to explain it to my grandma who asks every time I come home what it is that I do. And I have to explain to her that despite the fact that managers in my title, I don't actually manage people. She gets a little bit disappointed because she comes from an age where being a manager is like a really big deal. She's like, oh, well, that's cute that you have a manager in your name. 
But uh, <laughs> as, so as a product manager, we're, we're faced with this struggle of how do we actually motivate our team to solve the right problems? How do we communicate to them uh, what it is that's what it is that's going wrong? And talking about kind of the, this, this concept that, I'm, that I have of a productful conversation, uh, conversations with engineers that really lead to action are the ones that communicate a user in pain. Uh, great engineers are motivated by users in pain. Even if, uh, and this is again, this is a quote from, from Inspired by Marty Kagan, a uh, really, really great book. Um, if you can show an engineer that there is a real person out there that is having a problem, and you can, uh, you can get that engineer or anyone on your team to really empathize with that person, with their struggle, uh, they're going to be motivated to solve that problem, whether or not it was them that caused it. Uh, and I, I've seen this time and time again. Um, we'll talk about we'll talk about some of the settings in which you can have these conversations. But great, these great productful conversations are ones that use things like direct quotes from users. They uh, they use you know clips and videos. Um, actually, uh, and it's how we win. It's how we win this game of telephone, right? Winning this game of telephone is all about connecting users and engineers as closely as possible. PMs are the go-between. In an ideal world, in an ideal world, PMs wouldn't be necessary, and engineers would just understand what users need inherently at all times. Because that's not really possible, we're left with this good, better, best of uh, good is sharing insights with users, uh, supplementing with quotes, with quotes and recordings. There are a lot of teams that don't even get that far. Better is having real collaborative discussions about users and their needs. So we're not just sharing materials. We're not just sharing PRDs with quotes and you know and things like that, and recordings, and not just recordings of user sessions and, and all those things, but having real collaborative discussions with where there is a product manager and a salesperson who's talked to a user and Someone, uh, you know, we're Cuventus deliver stuff in hospitals. We have people on our team who are former doctors, and we'll pull them in to give us a doctor's perspective. Um, and engineers, and QA, and design, and and, and you kind of see uh, where you get. And ultimate, ultimately, the the best is putting your team face to face with those users. So um, we're about to take a trip to New York to go visit a customer out there. And I had to convince our eng lead and one of our data scientists why they should take three days and not work on whatever projects they're working on and instead come with me to New York to meet some of our users. And for the most part, it was, I actually just told their boss, like, they're, they're coming with me and you'll figure it out. Because um, actually it wasn't that hard to get them to, to come to New York on the company side. But um, talking about now, uh, now that we've kind of uh, said, here are some of the tools for winning this game of telephone, what are the settings in which, in which these sorts of interactions happen? Because we can't just spend all of our engineer's time. If an engineer lived with our user, they wouldn't have any time to build anything. Right? So uh, engineers hate unproductive meetings. There's nothing worse than trying to pull your team into a bunch of meetings that aren't necessary. So how do we make the most of their time? What are the sorts of structured interactions? Um, here's the typical life cycle of a feature. From discovery through to validation and planning, commitment, you get into this, this amorphous blob called the done zone, where depending on who's talking, anything in there could represent actually being done. Um, it's important. We're going to define it, and it's going to be great, and we're going to clear up a bunch of stuff. So, uh, And then each of these are things we're going to talk about. And actually, there's one that I forgot to put on this timeline because I added it this morning. Uh, called the three amigos. The three amigos is one of my favorite is one of my favorite interactions that you can have. It's kind of your it's your your go to. It's your your product consigliaries. Uh, you are the product manager, and you are trying to pull in your closest confidants to try and figure out how to solve a problem. Um, it's a really this is a really great way to build up a deep connection with your design lead and your engineering lead because it's essentially a three man council, three person a three person council that you pull together. Anytime you have a really interesting idea and you want to test technical feasibility, you want to know roughly how much time this is going to take us. Can we build it at all? How much time is it going to take us? What's it going to require? What are the platform improvements we need to make in order to make this possible? 
what might it look like, all these sorts of things. And the brainstorming kind of interactions that happen in this setting are really, really cool. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things to have. I, I had uh, the engineering lead on my team was, was kind of skeptical when I started scheduling these. They're like little half hour blocks of time that kept popping up on the schedule. And he was like, I don't know if it was really valuable. I swear, three sessions in, after we did, we did like three sessions, and then I had an interview, and I couldn't, and I had to cancel one of our sessions. And he's like, <laughs> you're not getting rid of three videos, are you? <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, the tool that I found to be the, yeah, the tool that I found to be the best, uh, uh, not, not the best, very good. I won't, I won't call anything, anything the best because nothing is universal. But this has been a really great tool for me in terms of talking about prioritization with your team, especially this kind of midterm. I think this is a midterm roadmap. So short term, short term, it's really easy to understand, to come to an understanding of what should we build next. It's also really easy to talk about long term uh, because long term isn't really real. You can talk about all the things that we think are important in the long term because we're not beholden to them. Uh, middle term, like what are we going to build in the next 90 to 180 days, or you know, the, what are we going to build a quarter from now? Uh, this whole this framework of rice is a really is a really great way I've found to structure conversations, especially in that small three amigos group around what do you think the impact is that we're going to achieve? What do you think the reach is that we're going to achieve? Uh, the scoring rubric that I use for this is just like a one to five score for each of these for each of these things. You know, give me a one to five for, for reach, one to five for impact. Reach is uh, the the uh, essentially how many different types of our users do we think we're going to affect? So like how many hospitals can use this? Is this just for doctors or can nurses use it to uh, impact for anyone who is using it? How much value are they going to get from it? I put impact here twice. I, that's a mistake. You guys should have caught me on that earlier. Um, it's uh, that third one isn't impact. It's actually confidence. And I apologize. That's embarrassing. Uh, confidence is, uh, so you have impact, how, what, what effect are you going to have? How much value is someone to get out of it? Confidence is how confident you are in all of the other scores that you've entered. So if you're really unsure, uh, if you're really unsure of something, that's a sign that you need to go back and do more user research. That's the whole point of user research when I'm talking about with my three amigos team in terms of what we need to go investigate. We look at things with the lowest confidence and it's, it's probably the most important thing on here. That's, that's not on there. Um, and effort is the actual effort it's going to take to build it, to implement it, to get to the point where users are able to realize any of this value. Um, story time. Uh, it has a fun, a fun, cutesy name. I guess the Three Amigos also a fun, cutesy name. Um, but uh, story time is where you actually talk about user stories. Uh, if if uh, there's this this the, this is a, I should have put it in quotes because it's an excerpt from uh, Jeff Patton's user story mapping. Uh, a user story is a placeholder for a conversation that you've had about a problem you can solve for a user. So a user story is actually, a, I think of it more as a placeholder than as a final arbiter of requirements. It, it is something that's going to remind your team of the conversation that you had. And so story time is something that, uh, that, uh, that is something that happens weekly. It's your, your whole team, by whole team, I mean product, engineering, design, uh, testing can attend. That's, it's useful for QA testing if they can swing it. Um, and product marketing, if you're, uh, if you're, you know, you're in B2B setting and you need to be able to develop customer facing materials, you need to make sure that whatever you're putting out in the world has to, uh, has to, has to reflect, um, has to reflect in your marketing materials. The goal. Uh, the goal is to actually talk about what it is, the conversation you had with your user, why it is that something's important. Um, a lot of times this takes the frame of, of talking about what's going to come up in the next sprint, if you use sprints, um, saying, yeah, here are, the, here are the things that we want to build, here's why. And then uh, it's, a, it's an arena where you can challenge the engineering team to then say, okay, well, how are you going to solve it from a technical perspective? A lot of times these conversations take the form of actually bargaining over acceptance criteria where the product manager says, I think it needs to be able to do these seven things. The engineering team says like, oh, well, we'll give you the first five because those are, those are a lot easier to do. And the last two, we have to break out into its own story and we'll do it later. Those are the sorts of interactions that happen in story time. Um, right sizing user stories like that is a, is a really important output of it. 
Um, and I'll say, I put weekly one hour. It's, I've seen different teams do it in different ways. In Scrum, uh, if, you're, if your team uses Scrum, a really regimented like one hour meeting works pretty well. I've worked with teams that do Kanban, where uh, if you have more of like a constant flow, something that's more Kanban style, then actually what I've found to work well is kind of ad hoc. Uh, you have these conversations when you, whenever you feel like you need them, when you feel like you need to populate your, your to-do column or whatever, with, you need to populate your backlog with more stuff. Is this your sprint cycle of a week or? We use sprint cycles of two weeks. So the goal is to get ahead is to, yeah, the, the goal is to get ahead of, of if you're if you're just talking about stuff like next sprint, you're not in that great of a place. You're not that you don't have that much cushion. Mm -hmm. um, and so like my goal is to try to be two or three sprints ahead in terms of when I think the things that we're talking about are actually going to get done. It gives the engineering team a lot more time to think through it. Um, yeah, there are a lot of reasons why that's yeah why that's good and. You could do bi-weekly for two hours, but who can actually focus in a two-hour meeting? <laughs> I can't. Disarming the done zone. Um, here are some actual quotes I have heard from people talking about the concept of done. Sure, it's done, but it's not done done. <laughs> it's done, but now we just need to finish it. And is anything ever done, man? <laughs> um, I, yeah. Um, I'm I'm curious I'm curious if, if you guys have, have heard anything like this. I'm seeing a lot of nods. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not crazy and not alone. Um, we had this problem at, at Juventus. We were at a point where uh, we were we were calling done. Done was code complete. The issue with uh, calling code complete done is that you haven't done any testing. You haven't merged anything into your production branch. You haven't released it to any customers. And so by virtue of that, what would happen is that we'd end a sprint with a bunch of tickets, with a bunch of work that we said was done. We took on a whole new sprint with a bunch of other work, and then we're dumbfounded when we had a really, really hard time releasing because we already committed to a bunch of work and releasing was just kind of extra. And our engineering team was just kind of struggling to find the time to get it all done. And so it led to this horrible state where our, our, uh, our releases were happening six weeks after the sprint that, where that work had actually been, where that code had actually been written, uh, six weeks after that sprint had finished. Um, and in the meantime, every other sprint was garbage because we were like half trying to release a bunch of stuff and half trying to build new stuff and everything was awful. So we wrote a new definition of done. And this is an actual document that we sat down with the team and said, here are the things that, that we mean when we say done. Um, um, this is, these are all the things that we meant that we mean when we say this is done and we kind of got to align all of these teams say like well here's what here's what we found when we talked to each when I talked to each of these people and asked like what is done what is done for you development like ah oh, it's code complete it's testing it's releasing it's customers understanding our product where you decide to draw that line can be different. There's, there might be some places where you have a team that does that does releases and they have a separate workflow from you. And so code complete might actually be done or testing might actually might actually be a good place to draw the line. Um, but what's really important to this next conversation that we're going to have is that you come into it with a with a definition of done that your whole team is buying into. And it's sprint planning. Uh, sprint planning is something that trips up a lot of teams, um, mainly because I think a lot of teams overthink it. Sprint planning at its core is thinking about what are the one or two things that our team is going to make sure that we get done at the end of the sprint. Um, people really, uh, a lot of teams, a lot of, a lot of engineers and product managers that I talk to really, really love uh, story pointing. And they index, they index really heavily on story pointing as a mechanism for sprint planning. I hate story points. They're awful. Um, they're awful as a tool for sprint planning in my opinion. Uh, they take a lot of time, it takes a lot of time to do story pointing well, and when you do it, you don't get all that much iterative value over just counting the number of tickets that you're adding into the sprint. Um, that to say, if any of my engineering cohorts are watching, you guys can use it for whatever you want, and I've told you that before. Um, it's sometimes useful to measure kind of complexity, and I've seen teams use it to measure as like an indicator of complexity, but it doesn't always translate to effort, and uh, yeah. 
that's my tirade on on story planning. But uh, the goal of story planning, or the goal of sprint planning, is to really come up with what is our plan for the sprint. And a lot of times, like I said, we overcomplicate this. It's we're going to build, we're going to build this thing, and this other thing. It's really simple. Uh, this, regardless of of kind of what tickets you're putting in. Uh, it's this really simple process of asking the team to commit to a high level concept and then figuring out what are the tickets that represent that, that work getting done. And it's that conversation around, let's talk about at the end of the spring, where do we want to be as a team? Um, part of that is focus. One of the great things about sprint planning is being able to clear the slate and say, hey, the last sprint is over. Let's talk about this sprint. Let's talk about what we want to get done and, uh, and actually like Focus. I would rather delay one project and oh yeah, I'd rather delay one project and like make meaningful progress while something else just completely waits than get two or three things half done. Yeah. So how do you then measure the So uh, if you if you insist on measuring like sprint velocity and those sorts of things, I think that. In practice, in practice, what I've found, uh, sprint velocity tends to be a hammer that gets wielded against the engineering team, and it's not something that many engineers really appreciate. Um, and the last thing that a product manager needs is another reason for engineers to kind of get upset with us. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just not that good a product manager, and engineers are always pissed at me because I'm changing my mind and <laughs> insisting that what I said the week before was totally wrong, and they should believe what I said this week. Mm -hmm. But um, there, there are a lot of reasons for why I'm not a huge fan of, of velocity, of like team velocity. There's research, there's a lot of research to suggest that uh, it takes like six sprints for a team to arrive at a steady sprint velocity, and that that totally resets any time you change the makeup of any team. And in Agile, in a real Agile like startup environment, for example, you're, it's really it's really easy to imagine your team changing, like not being the same for six weeks. Um, and not only that, the concept of a team is something that's that's really kind of squishy. Not many, not many of us work in a truly cross-functional team. You know, you have one engineer who's working on some project that they are uniquely qualified to work on for a couple of weeks, and measure comparing that to a point where the actual the whole team is actually working together on a on a project. They're not, they're not really. You can't really equate them. Uh, together, I will say, uh, if I, I use actual you count of user stories, count of user demonstrable pieces of functionality as my measure for velocity when I feel like it's something that I need, I use it as kind of the litmus test for do we have way too much work put into the sprint. Um, and if you think about right sizing user stories, if you think about trying to make all of you all of your user stories roughly the same size then that ends up, it ends up over the long run working, I, the research has said like 80% as well as going through like planning poker and doing all these things to have really finely tuned story points. I actually want to add on to that. So then I, because typically people would often say that uh, getting to those estimates actually is not about the estimates themselves but about having those conversations. Yes. So I assume you're still ha having those and it's just, Absolutely. Different ways of doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, that's a, and that's a really good point. I think, like I said, at, our, at its core, this is about developing shared understanding. And whatever works, no team is no team is the same. And actually, this is a really good transition into retrospectives, which is the last thing that I'll talk about. Every team is different. Uh, there's no no team has ever done textbook agile. It's textbook agile is is a is an interesting concept of like it's a team that. It's a team that does sprints and does all these different things and has all these ceremonies and kind of runs through kind of robotic. Not every there there is no team for which like textbook agile works. And so it's all about figuring out with your team today what are the processes that are going to help you really get to that get to shared understanding and understand and knowing that that shared understanding of the problems that users are having and uh, and how we're going to solve those problems is the end goal of any product and engineering team. And so retrospectives are a great way to center around like how well do we feel like we delivered things that were valuable to users this sprint, and how can we do a better job? Um, the best way that, that I found, the, there's this practice called uh, 
like uh, start, stop, continue. I like to simplify and just do and don't do. Um, what are the things that we need to do more of? What are the things we need to do less of in order to be a better team? Um, sometimes you, th those interactions can get a little bit heated at times, and which is good. You want there to be, there's supposed to be a pretty healthy tension between product and engineering. It's a, it's supposed to be a very prof you know professional, and we, we appreciate each other. But if we all agree on everything all the time. When, then as a product manager, we're not doing, I don't, I don't believe that we're doing our jobs well. We're supposed to be a little bit antagonistic and challenge challenge our team's thinking and challenge them to, you know, we're challenging them to think outside the box and all these different things. And we're challenging them to, one of my favorite things is challenging our processes, saying like, is this still the right way to do this? You know, is our definition of done still valid? Um, do we really think that we need to meet for an hour each week to do, to do story pointing? Uh, one time with my team at Zap Labs, I got rid of assigning tickets to people. I said like, we're not going to assign tickets to people anymore. And everyone is responsible for knowing the status of every ticket in our backlog. Because we had a bunch of people who would just go off on their own and work on their own thing. And we weren't, there was no kind of team dynamic in our work and people were making mistakes that other people would have caught. And so we got rid of assignments and everyone was actually responsible for everyone else's, for everyone else's tickets. Um, and we didn't keep it for very long, but everyone at least, everyone agreed that it was a, a useful exercise. And so um, the way that I've, the way that I've really found that, that structures this is like this happened, it made me feel blank is a really great way to try to encourage team members to structure feedback. Um, you know, uh, we spent, we spent a half hour, we spent an hour and a half talking about a platform rebuild I felt like that was a waste of my time. Um, that, that it's a really good framework to put feedback in in a way that is kind of uh, at Juventus we call it honesty delivered respectfully. Um, and I'll say what one of the yeah and so that's a really interesting framework. In terms of participants, this is one of the things that I take a really firm stance on. Uh, managers like are anyone outside of your team, including your like engineer's boss not allowed in retros and notes anything like notes recordings all those things stay with the team it's it needs to be an open forum for you as a team to figure out what it is that you guys are doing right and wrong um and it's it's supposed to be a really kind of sheltered honest open uh, open discussion it is kind of very it is it is very touchy-feely it's like more so than most engineers that i've met are initially comfortable with but when you actually get the team to kind of open up and, and talk about it, it can be a very cathartic uh, sort of experience. And you know, how do we how do we go about doing things? Um, they're best done at I find that they're best done at the end of the day on the last day of an engineering sprint. If you're wondering if you're wondering what to do, like if you plan your sprint from three to four, and you're wondering what to do with that weird four to five block where you're not going to ask an engineer to start a new project at four p.m. on a Friday, this is a good thing. To, this is a good thing to do. It's typically how I fill that block. Or, or actually, what I'll do is we'll end it at four, and then everyone will leave early. We'll be like, go away. Um, and the last, the last tip I'll give, I'll give here is, uh, start with the things that you did. Start with the things you did wrong, and close with all the things that went right in the spread. Uh, everybody, uh, people tend to slant cynical. When it comes to discussions like these, they want to talk about all it's really easy to index really heavily on all the things that went wrong. Uh, sometimes it's it's hard to it's hard to recognize all the things that went right. And you know, talking about productive conversations, like it's really important to go and recognize all the things that, that went right that we didn't really notice. So and the goal is to come out every time with one experiment, and I mean experiment, like a hypothesis, a testing plan. Uh, I used to write up at Zap Labs one page documents saying like, here's the test that we're running this week. Um, yeah, how we're going to test it, how we're going to know whether it succeeded and have it be a really rigorous, a really rigorous thing. That's, that's, it's a interesting, it's interesting when you actually get engineers to enter that mindset of, uh, analyzing every process as something that can be questioned with that same scientific mind that they're taking to actually doing code. Uh, you can get some really cool stuff done that way. Um, and then the very last thing that I'll say, probably even more important than any of the particular conversations that we've had, are all the little ones that you don't plan. 
Um, this is why it's really important for product managers to sit with their engineers and you know, interact with engineers as directly as possible, as often as possible. Um, just my little, my little pitch, go sit with your team. Super important.